party. Uh, again, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm your county commissioner, Portland County, uh, Andy Meyer. So I have a no, no, laundry list of people up here. No, no, we hope that's our request. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll speak as loud as I can. We have uh, from Congressman Pete Olson's office, Pat Perry, Pat, raise your hand. We uh, have Constable uh, Wayne Thompson. Uh, we have from the Sheriff's Office, Major Chad Darnell, he's over here. Uh, from Road Bridge, uh, Mark Grant. Uh, Mark is the individual who is in charge of debris removal. He'll be speaking to that. We have from our drainage district, uh, Mark Holder. Mark, raise your hand. Uh, he'll be speaking with regard to uh, the overall drainage uh, system. Uh, we have uh, our social services here, uh, our environmental health, our public health, emergency preparedness, uh, our behavioral therapy, they're all out on the other side and not up here. We have John Murray from Tetra Tech. Uh, John, raise your hand. John is uh, the Portland County's uh, outside consultant on uh, our recovery. We have Mike Jones with the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Mike. Raise your hand. Where are you at, Mike? Right now. Oh, Mike's in. Mike refuses to be our human shield up here, so he's in the audience. We have Mark Blackhouse, who is our fire marshal. Mark, raise your hand. Uh, we have uh, Mark uh, Lujan with the National Flood Insurance Program. Mark, raise your hand. There we go. Uh, the single people are on the way. We have Bob Webby with AECOM. He is the engineer for the World War Drainage uh, District that. Uh, Actually, y'all were here. We have uh, Representative Dr. John Zorlos. Dr. Dr. Uh, Zorlos is your uh, state representative. He is also the chair of the House Appropriations Committee. We have Paula Gibson with Senator Coburn's office. Paula, raise your hand. Senator Coburn has 21 counties in the state of Texas. We've covered 19 of them have been impacted. Uh, the Rockport area, which was hit the hardest, is in her area, and that's where she is today. Uh, and we have uh, Rick Stavely with our county engineer department. <laughs> Rick. Uh, we do have uh, two volunteer groups uh, from St. Faustina Catholic Church. Uh, John Gillespie, John, is, is he's here someplace? Is he out, outside? He's outside. So if you need assistance with regard to applying for FEMA, uh, application and other assistance. Uh, the Faustina Catholic Church volunteer group will assist you doing that and you can sign up with them uh, there outside. Uh, we have uh, also uh, Robert Pachukas, who is Robert's new here at church. Uh, Robert is here. Uh, he is uh, a representative of the church that is assisting people with uh, cleaning out their house. So if you need help in either of those two areas, see uh, St. Paul's Peter Group or Robert. Uh, if you want to sign up online for the assistance to clean out your help, uh, house, you can go to BayouCityRelief.com. BayouCityRelief.com. Uh, or you can see Robert uh, afterwards. Uh, we have a number of handouts uh, and maps uh, that you hopefully picked up. In addition, all of this information is online at uh, precinct3.com, P-R-E-C-I-N-C-T-T-H-R-E-E.com, precinct3.com. Uh, in addition, uh, this whole meeting is being uh, live streamed and also videotaped, uh, so you can go, if you want to see what was said, uh, and review what was said, you can go after, we will give us a little bit of time to post it, but after we get it posted, uh, we'll probably get that done Monday, you can go online and uh, we'll have it, uh, where you can go to uh, a YouTube uh, uh, link through precinct3.com and review what we, what we said. Okay, uh, FEMA people, are they here yet? Is there, they're the ones that know them. Okay, we have a FEMA representative here. So without further ado, and I don't know if you the going to have to come in here and tell us anything. Uh, so if you step up here and tell us who you are. Uh, let me, let me, okay, uh, before we get started, 
the process that we're going to go through is we're going to have FEMA to explain uh, essentially the program uh, with regard to FEMA. We are then going to hear uh, from uh, our U.S. Congressman's office and our state representative office with regard to what the federal government and the state government uh, are attempting to do on your behalf. So they can explain that in a second. After that, we'll have an explanation of the Bark Reservoir uh, from uh, Bark and from Bob. And, uh, they will briefly explain to you uh, the how the Bark Reservoir came about, the function of the Bark Reservoir. A lot of you believe that uh, the water from the police are to use, that's actually not the way it works, and they will explain that to you. They'll also explain to you uh, essentially some of the things that uh, could possibly be done uh, to mitigate uh, the impact. Uh, and then after that, we'll have uh, an explanation of, of how you can sign up uh, with FEMA if you have not already done so, and then we'll be back up here. And then we, we are going to have uh, some questions that we have asked people to post online, uh, and we have, we have some 460 of them. Uh, and we also have asked you to fill out uh, the cards that are on the table back here and put them in uh, the box, and we'll uh, answer the questions. Uh, most of the questions are actually the same, uh, so uh, we, we believe that we will cover most of those things, uh, uh, and uh, we, we hope to get you out of here in a fairly short period of time. We have as much information as you need to carry on with your uh, trying to recover from this disaster. Without further ado, this gentleman here is this gentleman is Marcus Harmon, and he is with FEMA, and he is. Marcus is with IHP, and that means. Okay, I'll let him explain it. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus Harmon with Individual Assistance with FEMA. And um, under Individual Assistance, we have a program called Individuals and Households Program. That program is, um, with, is with grant assistance, a uh, grant which you have to pay back. Um, first and foremost, you have to get registered with us. That's the only way we can know that you're out there. That's the only way we know if you need assistance. Um, the max grant is 33300 and that includes rental assistance. It includes critical needs assistance. Um, but you can only get that once you've been inspected. Now, I know um, inspections have been running today. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
you know if you'll qualify to get any assistance from FEMA? Hold on. You would have to get registered and kind of look into your file. If you're insured, we want to see the insurance documents first, the settlement or the denial letter. If you're in, well, because we also help people who are underinsured. So say the insurance companies owe me giving you $40,000 and $50,000 of damage. You would possibly be able to cover the rest of it. We would just need to see first what the insurance company is doing for you. Um, also, if you're uninsured, we'll help you too. How do we give you the denial letter? We're not going to take any questions from you right now. We've, we've got several thousand people here. We're, we're trying to cover all the issues, but we apologize. Uh, FEMA, unfortunately, we're here at the wrong address, uh, and that's uh, that's on us. Uh, uh, so I I apologize. Uh, that was handled by. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to announce it. I'm not the one who called it, or they would have had the right address. Uh, I am looking for somebody to address the issue of potential buyouts. Is there anybody on the class who can address that issue? All right, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm just going to take this out. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. All right. Who are you? Who are All right, I'll, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Mark Lujan, and I manage FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program for this region. So, okay, so let me, let me touch on this first. Okay, before we get into the area of buyouts, I want to touch on just a couple of things first. If I could see just by a show of hands, how many folks did have flood insurance? Okay, so quite a few. And, and while we are here today, the reason why I'm bringing that up is I want to make sure that you did receive your advance payments from your adjuster, okay? Some of you were saying no, so I, I, want, to, I want to hear that. I want to be able to talk to you guys about this afterwards, because those have been authorized. They've been authorized from your carriers, your insurance company, whether that be Hall, State Farmers, whoever that may be, they're what we call right your own companies. They, that has been authorized by law. So, so you can get that, okay? Number two, we want to make sure that for those of you who had flood insurance, that your claim is handled as smoothly as possible. Now, as far as time goes, we've got about 2,000 flood adjusters that are out in the field. For the amount of homes that have been damaged, Obviously, when we say that we'd like to see an adjuster come out within 24 to 48 hours, that deadline's been pushed back a bit, as you guys can, can tell. Especially with Irma going on and everything else, this is kind of what has transpired. So, with that being said, though, we are working as quickly as possible, getting those advance payments so you can start working with your local community on obtaining the proper permits, etc., to start that rebuilding process. Okay? Now, let me touch on buyouts. That's been a question that has come up in every meeting that, that I've been to since I arrived. I, I'm actually up in the Denton, Texas, out of the FEMA Region 6 office. So that's where I'm saying I handle Texas and all the surrounding states with the program. One thing that we talk about buyouts is after a presidentially declared disaster, which this was obviously, federal dollars are released. When it comes to hazard mitigation grant program and those kind of things, this lump sum of money is then given to the state. The state then will work with the local communities on setting priorities for what they are going to do with that money. FEMA at ourselves, we do not actually do the buyout process. We give that money and it goes through the state. Okay, so they are sub grantee We give that money to the state. So here's what, what I uh, am suggesting, and, and any of the folks can, can add into this as well. You need to contact your local permitting office, your floodplain administrator, and work with them. Are they here today? They, we do. Do we have some? Yes. 
Okay, so we do that, and I, and I will let him come up and just add on to that, but that's the process. And we, they think that we as FEMA come in and we are the ones that do the fires. That, that's considered a take if I government standpoint. So we don't do that. We give the money through the state. Okay, is everyone clear on that? Okay, I just want to make sure everybody everybody understands that. That's very, very, very important that everyone understands that. Okay. And and uh, I know we're not taking questions. Whose rule is the hundred year flood plain? We're not taking questions. Rule is <laughs> so the hundred year flood plain? Yeah. Okay, that is for your flood insurance rate now. And I, I don't like to use the hundred year flood plain. Because it means it doesn't mean if you flooded this last week, that it's gonna be another hundred years before you flood. Big, big misconception, and so I, I hate that of those terms, to be honest with you. So we always say the 1% chance in any given year. So if you've got a 30-year mortgage, you've got a 26% chance of having a flood within your 30-year mortgage. Okay, so that, that kind of puts it into more tangible terms. Everyone's at risk. Whether you are, how many people know if you were in flood zone X? The low to moderate risk flood plain. We got some of you, okay? And, and out of those hands, if I could, how many of you flooded? Okay, this is what I'm saying. When we talk about this low to moderate risk, you still have a significant risk of flooding no matter what the map shows. Reason is because of development. The flood insurance rate maps that were created were a snapshot in time. When those were done several years ago, those studies start six, seven, eight years ago. Because the gates. Sorry, because the gates. The gates, the gates were closed. The gates, yes. And and I and I will I will let the other other folks address that. But what I'm saying is, when you've got this runoff, when you've got those gates and that water's coming through, that water doesn't just come in and say, "Whoops, we crossed into the X zone. We, we've got to stop." Right? That water goes right straight on through. So the hundred year. 500 year floodplain for the X zones. I like to put this in more tangible terms. Everybody's at risk. You've got the 1% chance in any given year for the 100 year floodplain. Okay? So I wanted to make sure everybody is, is clear on that. I'd be more than happy to answer any flood insurance questions, things that you're seeing. Um, not, not from here, but maybe things that, that you guys have turned in online, from what I'm understanding. So we will, I want to help you. Okay? We all up here want to help you and get you back to where it is. I actually lived in Katie for about six, seven years, and I may know some of you in the audience that, that, I, uh, that I know from, from years past. So this, this area is real, real important to me. I, I really like this area. So it, uh, it hurt me when I heard about Cinco Ranch area and everything like this. So anyway, I, uh, I'm here, we're here to help you. Okay, so that's what we want to do. So we will, we will touch on that. I'll let anybody else address the, the buyouts for All right, somebody else addressed the issue with regard to uh, signing up with the jurisdiction. And the gentleman walking up is Rick Stagley. He is the chief assistant county engineer, and he has answers to some questions. While it is correct that the money will come from the feds to the state, that is a very long process. Uh, we started that process for the Cummings Road area, which flooded in 2016, Memorial Day flood. That grant was applied for last October. We're hearing we're at least six months away from hearing whether we're going to get that money. So when you say that there's money coming, we don't know when that will be. That is all up to the federal and the state government. However, we will be starting a process that will get people signed up. It is a voluntary program if we get the money. We do not come in and condemn. Therefore, we start the list. Once we know the grant process is open, we will put those that want to be considered for that buyout program on the list and get the grant application in. Once again, it is a very long federal and state process. When will the application start? We have not been told that at all yet. By who? Harris County already has a complete buyout plan. Harris County may have already been in a program. Fort Bend County has not been. The Cummings Road area was the first time that we've entered into that federal and state program. As to when that will become available, we will hear that from the state probably within the next 30 to 60 days. The state authorizes the application? The state, the state will be letting us know what the federal application dates are. 
John, do you have more available information? What's the criteria for John Murray with uh, Tech and Tech? He's our consultant that helps us coordinate the FEMA. Every disaster is, uh, as the gentleman from NFIP uh, stated, you can, uh, the, the government will allocate funding to hazard mitigation and through the 404 HMGP program. And that, as uh, Rick mentioned, is uh, going to be made available in the coming weeks. That, that allocation, that pool of money is calculated based on uh, a formula. Uh, and that is not even uh, uh, established or locked. There's a, a one year, a six month, and a one year lock in for the, that funding through the federal process. So it's something that is going to be coming up uh, soon. All right, we're going to continue with uh, the explanations here. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is call Dr. Zerlis up. Uh, he can, he can briefly explain where the state is in this whole process. I know that uh, Dr. Zerwes has been working very hard, and he's been doing it uh, like you. Uh, unfortunately, he had six feet. Uh, he had uh, 15 inches of water in his house, so he's uh, suffered uh, like all of you have. And he's been dealing with the same issues that you have, so he, he's where you are. I actually had I actually had water in my house. I lost my wood floors. Uh, this is another issue. I didn't have that much water in it. So, but we all have had the same experience that you've had, and uh, we're going through the same frustrations that you're going through, I believe. So, without further ado, Dr. John Zerlis. Thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you for your tireless efforts on behalf of uh, Fort Wayne County and very specifically Precinct Three. Your office has been an enormous resource, I think, to the constituents. Uh, in this part of Fort Lincoln County, and we're truly uh, privileged to have you and your team in that role, so I want to thank you for that. And um, as the Commissioner said, I guess I, I lived through it. I had a Task Force One boat rescue from my home uh, in, uh, in the evening, late evening, nighttime hours, and uh, of course it went without any event. We came back into the district with our water with both gasoline for more boat evacuations. Uh, uh, the sun got totally wiped out in the whole process, he and his wife. And so uh, so it, it is something that, that I, I can tell you on a very personal level, I feel and I understand what you're going through, and I'm dealing on a personal level with the same thing. But that's, that's not why I'm here for you today. And certainly we can exchange those stories if you like at some point privately. But uh, from the state government point of view, uh, what, what I want you to know is that uh, I do think Governor Abbott and his team has, has done a very, very extraordinary job of at least positioning assets for what is the most epic storm in the history of this state, if not this country. And there truly was not anything that was uh, not mobilized on our behalf as the storm did exactly what the forecasters said it could very likely do and dump this incredible amount of water in a very, very short period of time. And we have, we have seen now and experienced uh, a flood that, that obviously we all hope it won't ever happen again, but I don't think that we can ever strategize effectively based on hope and that we need to very seriously look at what we can do going down the road. The immediate needs right now are the ones that are of most importance. And from the state perspective, trying to mobilize and create those resources to come down to the, to, to the state is the most important thing that we do. We have the attention of our entire congressional delegation. There is no doubt about that. We have the attention of the president, who has made some exceptions in terms of extending the resources available to us. So, uh, so the nation is, is watching this, and the nation is responding to it. Your state government is going to work through its current agencies in order to try to create this partnership with FEMA, in order to make sure that these monies can be brought back effectively brought back to the homeowners and the citizens in the district here. Uh, a lot of that will happen through the general land office uh, headed up by Commissioner Bush. This is very recent information that has come through. Uh, they will be working very closely with some short-term and long-term efforts to help us deal with mitigating these things. Uh, my office is there for you to tap into when it comes to anything to do with state agencies. That information is available to you, if not, we are made available to you. Uh, we certainly invite your, your, your questions, but most of all, especially when we're not during a legislative session, 
which is the period of time that we're in right now. We are there to help you really deal with the agencies and a lot of the bureaucracy that goes on there. This is an unusual circumstance. This is not by any means routine. Um, and everybody is trying to feel their way through it. My office will work with you to the extent that we can to make sure that if there's something that needs to happen to one of the state agencies, we're going to be there for you and try to facilitate that. One of the questions I've been asked in my round, so with the commissioner and many up here, has been, what about the Rainy Day Fund? As uh, many of you are aware, we have a fund of about $11 billion that sits in, uh, in basically a, a fund in order for us to tap into if we need it for a variety of circumstances. The governor has indicated at this point that those, the funds that he can actually manage in the agencies themselves is adequate in order to meet the needs that are out there. Uh, I will tell you, I have been a strong advocate of we'll sit down and look at this very closely. In fact, in about a week, we're going to sit down and have a, uh, a hearing at the House Appropriations Committee to look at what our funding and necessities are. Uh, I have always been very, very much a proponent of that money is there for the benefit of Texas. And that if it's ever a rainy day, it's a rainy day in Precinct 3 in Fort Bend County right now. And we will stand there ready to promote their and advocate for that on their behalf if we have any need to do that. So, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll continue to work on your behalf. Uh, these are these are drawn out, complicated things. I know you already feel like they're drawn out. I know I do. And, uh, and we're going to do everything that we can in order to get you in a place where you can get back in your home, try to resume your life in as reasonable way as you can, make sure your children are back in the schools that you, you came and located here for. So, Commissioner, with that, I'll stop and uh, I'll answer any questions that come up in the uh, Thank you, Dr. Zervos. We have a uh, representative from Pete Olson's office, not very tight in a address issue with regard to what uh, uh, our congressman is doing and, and, this, and basically what Congress is doing to address this issue. So, Ty. Thank you. Uh, like uh, the commissioner said, my name is Ty Betty. Uh, I'm Congressman Olson's district director. I oversee the day to day operations of the 22nd congressional district here in Texas. Uh, just on a very high level uh, to start, uh, the congressman has been very busy uh, working on some of these issues with uh, the national government. As many of you know, President Trump came down here. The congressman was there on the tarmac at Huntington to meet him. Uh, he has handed he hand him a list of specific needs for Fort Bend County, uh, as well as Brazoria County, those portions that we represent. And as the commissioner, as the commissioner and the county judge can tell you, uh, the congressman has been very engaged, bringing uh, congressional leadership down here. Uh, Leader McCarthy was in the district uh, immediately after the hurricane, and just this week, the congressman hosted Speaker Paul Ryan. Uh, down here to discuss some of these issues. And in both of those meetings, the congressman delivered a list of the needs for the district as well. Um, some other things that the congressman is working on is uh, he is uh, engaging with uh, FEMA and local officials, uh, both state and locally, on emergency supplemental money. Uh, many of you saw Congress pass the bill uh, that was uh, just a down payment on some of the emergency operations that was to keep FEMA operational the grant money coming in uh, to keep the SBA uh, program financed and running here in the storm. Uh, through this process, uh, we could expect several, probably, emergency supplemental bills uh, to come down. Uh, that's a fight that they're going to have to have in Congress. And uh, hopefully, the, the Florida and Texas delegation uh, will continue to work together uh, on those to provide the funds for uh, both these storms relief packages. Uh, other issues he's working on is he's working uh, with our FEMA partners and HUD partners on developing the rules and the programs that are going to be these relief programs that, uh, like some of the other speakers uh, talked about, where the federal money comes back to the state uh, in forms of block grants. A lot of that money, uh, uh, the rules for how the money can be spent, where it's going to be spent, are going to be developed uh, by HUD and the state. And so the congressman is very engaged in that process, making sure that those rules are written in a way that that aid can get down here quickly, and that is uh, the best possible way for the state to administer those programs as well. Uh, the congressman is also heavily engaged right now with the Corps of Engineers, working on identifying uh, what worked, what didn't during the storm, but also uh, on potential future mitigation projects, such as the third reservoir. The congressman uh, has partnered with Congressman McCall uh, about the third reservoir, and he's already uh, had several meetings with the Corps of Engineers looking into those projects. 
uh, as well and what's possible there. Um, on a local level, um, more of what uh, our office can do to help you all. I know we've, we've met with, with several of you, several community leaders and, and many others in the community. Uh, the congressman uh, has set up a, a Harvey desk in his office and what I mean by that is we have dedicated staff that all we do is handle Harvey related issues. We, we move people away from kind of the functions uh, that we normally do in the office and we, we are dedicated to helping people with casework, whether it be uh, FEMA issues uh, or the SBA loan process. We know those, those processes are difficult and there's a lot of bureaucratic jargon in there and that's what our office is here to do. We, we want to help with those. We want to help uh, get you through the application process and we're happy to nudge those agencies and, and interject where we need to. Uh, I have some, some of our Privacy Act forms and some FAQ sheets uh, in the tables out in the lobby area there. Um, you're welcome to grab that or you can call any of our offices and, and we're happy to get to work on that. that that's one thing the Congress is very passionate about is that we're going to be responsive and we're going to be helpful uh, and, and we really want to, want to serve you all in those, in those issues. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't think about uh, that I want to bring your attention that we can help with too is, is still with all the other federal agencies. A lot of times in disaster you've got a lot of lost important documents, particularly uh, immigration documents and, and tax documents and things like that or, or other federal documents. Uh, that's going to be critical in helping you recover and getting you through the aid process and our office can help get those and, and move that process for you as well. Um, check my notes. Uh, real quickly on, on inspections, uh, just to touch on that from our end, uh, like I said, we are going to be helpful uh, with the, the agencies involved in the recovery process. Uh, many, many folks, especially from the Canyon Bay area, have reached out about inspection uh, issues, and we are aware of those, and the congressman is engaged on those. Uh, he's actually had a couple meetings and spoken to several people about innovative ways that we can go uh, about doing that, making sure that still all the legal uh, T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there'll be more on that forthcoming uh, in the coming days and weeks. But we are aware of it, and you know we're happy to get those inquiries. But like like the uh, folks said, um, there's just not enough inspectors to go around, and we, we apologize for that. And we're, we wish we could be more helpful, but we can't move you to the front of the line. Many people have called and asked and said, you know, I have it worse than the people over there. Why can't I get the inspection first? And, and you know, obviously the Congress. I wish that, you know, because you all are our neighbors, you're all here, we wish we could move you to the front of the line, but unfortunately the process doesn't work like that. So please be patient with us as, as we do that. And like I said, we'll do everything we can to help you. Uh, any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to stick around after, uh, and I'll also be at the other meeting later as well. So. Thank you, Chad. Uh, again, we want to make clear that uh, the FEMA gentleman said that uh, the FEMA sends the money to the state, the state uh, disperses it. That's great. There is no money. Okay? But I want to make it clear. There is no money. What we are trying to do is we, we at the local level and at the state level, is working with our Wilson's office, with our two senators office, with the other uh, congressional delegation from Texas, also with the delegation from Florida, to get Congress to appropriate the funds uh, to address these issues. Congress is not appropriating the money. There is no funds for buyout yet. So we're they working on that. Save money, save funds. is the case here. We are looking to the federal government to fund uh, the same kind of funding that they did for Katrina and for Sandy. This is not unprecedented for the federal government. They've done this in the past. We believe they will do it again. I'm just trying to make you aware of the fact that those appropriations are not in place yet. Now, uh, for those of you who have lost some important documents like your birth certificate or your marriage certificate or whatever, you can contact our county clerk's office and they will uh, uh, supply you with that for free. With that, I'm gonna, I, I think it's fair to have a look back. Uh, we had asked uh, the Corps of Engineers, the uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers to be here today. They initially had said yes and then they uh, received eight lawsuits. Uh, so they uh, lightly declined. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, to be here. Uh, so, Thank you. 
Okay, I think Kellywood is in the upper, kind of the upper portion of Fort Bend County, right on the boundary of Fort Bend County and Harris County, uh, right on that area, correct? When they came in, again, this is the very first subdivision, Fort Bend County had not, not had a development come in into the area immediately adjacent to the core reservoir area. So when the first one came in, the 100-year floodplain at that time, or as John would say, or Mark would say, the 1% annual chance of flooding at that time was estimated to be at 97 feet above sea level, which happened to be the boundary of the core's property, the core owned property. And so with that, the county's policy was take that elevation, 97, add a foot to it, and no house in Kellywood Green should be less than 98 feet mean sea level based on that data at that time. Now remember, because of subsidence and other issues, those numbers have changed today. I'm speaking back in 1988, 1990 terms. So once that first subdivision came in, the county commissioners and the county engineers and the drainage district all had some concerns that this property, even though it wasn't part of the core's property, it was still partially surrounded by levees and, and could be affected by control releases by the core. We had concerns. Uh, we expressed that to the developers and, and we had discussions with them. The county was thinking that some additional information needed to be provided here. Developers weren't uh, receptive to that initially. Their, their point to the county was that our policy says you have to build at least one foot above the 1% chance of rain or what I'm calling the 100-year flood plain. We applied that across the entire county and we made it more stringent in this area for whatever reason. Statistically, it was no different in this region than it would be anywhere else in the county because there's a 1% chance that it could happen there, there's a 1% chance that it could happen out in the country in the San Bernard River watershed, there's a 1% chance that it could happen in Sugarland. So to play on an equal playing field, it's a 1% chance everywhere. And we applied more strict restricted rules like a 500 year floodplain or a 1,000 year floodplain regulation. It would be unfair to them. So through the debates and discussions with the developers and their attorneys, we felt that at least the homeowner should be notified, and the only mechanism that we had to notify them was by placing notes on the plat. That's the only authority the county has. We did an authority by the state to require planning, and that didn't come until 1984. And so with that mechanism, we required the developer to put notes on the plat saying that this property may be subject to inundation, extended inundation, as a result of the, the control of the reservoir. So that was done. I did a recent count, I think there were at least 54 plats that I saw that had that note on there. And maybe more than that. So, with that being said, we went all on that last basis. Am I doing okay back there, everybody? Okay. Then the court changed. Not, uh, not on elevations, but they changed their release rate. They said, instead of releasing at a certain rate all the time, now, if there's any chance of rain within the next 24 hours down in Houston or Harris County below the reservoir, they're going to shut the gates and not release any water. Well, that throws the curve. Uh, this 97 floodplain that had been going on for many years, or for several years, uh, was, in our mind, no longer the case because we had no idea what type of rain events we would experience, what type of release rates they could do, because nobody knew what kind of rain would be coming in the next 24 hours or over, this, over a time period. So that being said, the county went back and in-house we recalculated. We said, okay, for this 126 square miles, if we have a 100-year rainfall, which is approximately 12 and a half inches of rain in 24 hours, and those gates remain shut, how much water is that and how full of the reservoir is? Our calculations roughly back in 1988 data numbers were 99.9 .9 feet. That's how high the water would get in the reservoir. So with that information, we then changed our minimum house Flat elevations on flats from 98 to 100.9, which is 100.9 is one foot higher than the 99.9, which we calculated to be the new 100 year floodplain level based on the core's operating procedures that they described to us. Okay, so we continue on that basis. We also have requirements that if, if slabs or subdivisions are above that elevation, like if the land of the subdivision is 103 feet above sea level, we still put it on there that all the slabs have to be at least 18 inches above that, so the minimum slab would at least be 104 and a half. And, and so we have a number of criteria that we use, even if you're not in the point. With that being said, we uh, 
continue to manage things like that. And in, in this particular event, the, the storm that we saw was a record storm. There had been previous floods. Uh, I think there was a flood in 1994 that was about uh, 35, 3900 cubic feet per second. This is measured at Kingsbridge Road at the USGS gauging station. That was the highest flood that was on record. The 2016 flood, the Pax Day flood, that blew that record out of the water. That flood was about uh, 58, 5900 cubic feet per second coming down a uh, little more than a couple of miles of Kingsbridge Road. This event measured around 9,000 cubic feet per second. So we're, we're significantly increasing the, 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 the uh, record flows here in the past couple of years. Now, Fort County requires all developers in the Willow Fort watershed, which drains in the park and reservoir, drains through your, through your subdivisions, we require them to use the kitchen in accordance with our criteria manual. That basically says you have to take a 12 and a half inch rainfall, apply it across your development, after you develop it, and show that you cause no increase in deep flow rates anywhere downstream. That's our policy. And we've applied the number to all developments, and they've almost all got the kitchen policy. Now, as you get down into the single ranch area, when they were developing, I'll correct if I'm wrong, they were able to work out an agreement with the core to create a diversion channel, a little more diversion channel, and bypass these flows so that they can get their flows in the reservoir uh, and, and don't have to have the tension. Now, I think you do have some detention ponds in some areas. Okay. They, they were able to work that out where they were able to drain their water into the reservoir. Think of this, they're right there on the face of the reservoir, so their water's going to get into the reservoir whether they detain it or not. They're just very downstream in. It's the first water to go into the reservoir. And hopefully, if they would open the gates, the gates would allow some of that water to go out to provide more room for some upstream watershed. But be it as it may, the core operates the reservoir as they think is necessary, and we don't have any control over that. So we require attention for the 12 and a half inch rain. This rain that you saw, if you all know, was in excess of 12 and a half inch rain. You had maybe it wasn't 12 and a half inches on any given day, but you had a significant rain on day one, which filled the system up. The storm sewers were full, the detention ponds had water in them, so that water's trying to drain down. The other 126 miles of the watershed above us is trying to drain down into us. So water here locally is trying to drain out, the water above us is coming out, and then the next day you get another wave on top of it, a significant rain. The next day you get another wave, and the next day you get another wave. So the system was totally inundated. I know people are blaming development, maybe development has some impact on it, but even if there was been no development in the watershed, the first day would have saturated the ground, filled all the potential storage up in the rice fields that had been there prior to any development occurring. So now it's completely full. Cool. Maybe there's no water in the channel or very little water in the lower port, but then you get the subsequent rain on the next day, the subsequent rain on the day following that, and subsequent rain on the day following that. You get 100% off because now you have nothing in the lake and water flowing in the lake with no other place to be stored. It's got to run off. I'm not taking up a core. I'm just trying to describe the factors that are existing in the field today. With that being said, what are some solutions? There, there are possible solutions that just have to be looked at and see which is the most cost effective. There was a reservoir that's been discussed and on the books for, for consideration since I think the 80s. It's, uh, it's up in the uh, Cypress Creek. Uh, reservoir that would capture the flows from Cypress Creek. I think I've seen numbers somewhere around 23 million acre feet of water, uh, 23,000 acre feet of water, excuse me. And so there would be a big relief that would provide possibly some more storage and maybe the court could release more water out of the reservoirs then or keep it lower. And there's possible potential for other reservoirs. Uh, another thing to consider is possibly increasing the capacity downstream in Harris County and the city of Houston so that we can pass more flows or the court can pass more flows out there. With that, I'm going to uh, stop my presentation. Thank you. Uh, essentially, well, the problem we have is, is twofold. One, a funding problem. We've had uh, a reservoir um, proposed since uh, the late 80s that was never funded by uh, the government. Uh, part of the problems we have uh, is environmental. Uh, the environmental restrictions we have are substantial. Uh, and they add not only a significant amount of time, it takes 15 to 20 years to get one of these things approved, but it also adds a, a significant amount of uh, cost. And even after that, uh, uh, they, uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, faces lawsuit from the environmentalists who do not want to change the current conditions. Uh, we have a problem, and, and Mark didn't address this, but I will. 
uh, with regard to maintaining our own drainage system. We maintain the system, but we have an inability to expand it because of the problems we have getting approvals from the Corps of Engineers to expand any of our drainage systems, which we have to go through a lengthy process. We face environmental restrictions. Uh, in one case, we attempted to get a, a drainage system approved, and we were denied because we were going to impact the prairie chicken uh, uh, habitat, and so they did that. So that's the problems that we're facing, uh, and th those problems are addressed at the federal level. Now, I do want to uh, take a brief moment to have Mark Gray come up. Uh, Mark is our uh, uh, road bridge commissioner. He's the guy in charge of uh, debris removal, and he can tell you all about debris removal. Okay, why aren't we there? We should have already been there. You missed me. Why did you skip me? Why am I? Why are you not on my screen? You know, I've heard everything that there is out there, and the government's telling you we're coming eventually. We've got a couple more weeks before we should be able to make the very first pass all the way through the county. We have. Um, been in the Seco Ranch area for eight days now. And Seco Ranch, the whole general area. I mean, uh, you got to realize that we have collected to date 160,000 cubic yards. Uh, we have 20 of the large trucks that you see in the area. Those are the most economical and the best fit for bringing in the debris as quickly as possible. You've got to understand that we're, we've gone from the Simons and Fulcher area to the Meadville area, Richmond, Rosenberg, uh, Missouri City, Stafford. It, it got us everywhere. There is not another truck, big truck, to be found in this region or any other region in Houston. Houston has decided to go with 15 yard dump trucks and they are filling up the landfills with these dump trucks. So we set up debris sites so we could get it off of the, in front of your yards quicker and faster. I know for some of you it's not fast enough, but we're out there working seven days a week, 12 to 14 hour days, and we're trying to get around everyone as quickly as possible. What I'd like to say is we're gonna it's gonna take three passes because that there is so much debris in front of everyone's homes. Once we make the first pass, bring your debris back up to the curb so that we can reach it again. We will repeat this three times. The refrigerators, the white, the white goods, the uh, HHW, which is your paints and other things and your e-waste, which is your televisions and others, those will be picked up after we've made at least one sweep, possibly two sweeps, because of how much debris keeps coming out. And it's hard to get to those, those items. All I'm asking is for you folks to be patient. We're working diligently at it, and we will be on your street. We will to pick up all your debris, so bear with us, please.
Um, you know, we've got people talking about buyouts and people talking about rebuilding, but we really need to be united on our front at the county level, the state level, at the county level, the state level, and the federal level if we want to be successful in this. Um, and we need to be patient. You know, we're, we're Texans. Whether you were born here or whether you came here, we're all Texans now. We're all going to get through this together. Um, after my experience. So uh, we were evacuated out uh, Monday, which was, I believe, August 28th. I don't, I don't even know. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we pretty much lost everything in our home. Uh, FEMA has come out. You know, I didn't make any extra phone calls to anyone. I've been working diligently with the county and uh, with Representative Zerwas to try to get accurate information. Uh, I run our Facebook page for our neighborhood. Uh, and have just been trying to get accurate information out there. We've got a lot of misinformation, a lot of rumors that swirl, so I've been focusing my time and efforts on that, but, um, uh, you know, I didn't do anything extra to reach out to FEMA to try to get a representative to come, come out and see me, but they have come out and seen me, they have assessed us, and we've already gotten our money. Um, <laughs> Several thousand homes that are uh, uh, ruined. So you should play I should. I should. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start asking questions to uh, that you guys have submitted online, and I've also got the stacks of questions that are up here. Um, okay. So yeah, a lot of those are the same questions that have been. Congratulations, Superman. All right, uh, first questions are going to be aimed towards FEMA, and I understand we have some uh, supervisors here that got here a little bit late. If you wouldn't mind saying your name. My name's Jerry Bob with the General Affairs. We got out here. My name is uh, Ed McQuillan. I'm a division supervisor for Fort Bend County. I am responsible and accountable for successful service delivery of FEMA programs. Okay. Uh, the first question on my list is actually aimed towards the county, so I'll get back to that one. But uh, why are some people in my neighborhood getting grants and others denied completely? We all make about the same financially. If income is a determining factor, we need to know. Yeah, so uh, the first point that's most important is everyone needs to register for FEMA. Can we see a show of hands of everyone who's registered? We're good on that. Excellent. That is the most important thing. Each registration represents another three people as we average out for families. Uh, so you need to move through the process and um, I need your help in helping get the message out that you need to get to a DRC when you can, you need to update your registration. That's your name, Disaster Recovery Center. And the closest one here is in Katie Mills. It's at 5000 Katie Mill Drive. It's in the mall. There's an outside unit with tent, and there's also an inside unit closest to, uh, I believe it's B, Sick B is the parking area where you can find that. It's very important that you update your status if your home was inaccessible due to flooding. You need to now mark it accessible. That will send a click forward that an inspector can get into your home. Okay, this is why you need to get into a disaster recovery center. The key point here, folks, is that it's individual assistance. Every person, every family are going to have different issues, different concerns. A lot will be similar, but based on your parameters, your family, it's going to be different. It's one case at a time times 850,000. I can tell you that I don't always sleep well at night because I know the work that we do that directly affects people's recovery. 
All right, so thank you for saying all that, but that was not an answer to my question, and uh, this gentleman wanted to say something. The question was, if income level is a determining factor in being denied or being uh, granted, uh, can, can you answer that question? Is income a factor? It is not a factor. It's based upon need only. Need only. I'm sure your questions are in here, uh, so let's stay on point and try to get this information out to us, okay? I just want to apologize there. Uh, to be clear, uh, the assistance is not based on income. It's needs-based only. Individual assistance, needs-based only, not based on income. Okay, the next question is, why did no one tell us that if we were offered a loan from SBA, that means we are denied assistance from FEMA. I wanted to wait to see what assistance I would get from FEMA before taking on a loan and had no idea that by saying no to the SBA loan, I would be denied any assistance. Um, so you aren't denied any assistance if you deny an SBA loan. The SBA loan, if you, if you are eligible for an SBA loan, we do require that you at least apply. You don't have to take the loan if you don't want to. If you deny the loan, if you don't want it, it comes back to FEMA, and that's when you can possibly receive grant assistance. So if you are eligible, it says um, that you are eligible on your file, and someone looks it up, and you have, you have to see an SBA representative, fill out an application with them, you don't have to take the loan. As long as you're... But you do have to apply. But you do have to... You do have to do it at the same time. You can apply with FEMA and SBA if you are eligible. Um, you don't... You don't have to take if you if you're accepted for if you're if you are offered a loan you don't have to take it. If you do take the loan, then you will not be able to get FEMA assistance. So if you don't want to take the loan, then Accessible to accessible. You have to see someone's face. They push that over. 
but it's under your app store and it's the FEMA Gov app and it's got great resources to track. You know, it's a communication tool for you guys because you have to have diligence and check up and kind of let you know about the process. Right now we're at a 21 to 30 day, uh, you know, for that inspection to be complete, documented, and pushed forward. So we have 270,000 inspections on the books right now. It grows every day. So the quicker you get it, the quicker you track, the more due diligence we do as individuals, the quicker the turnaround time will be. That's good too. That's good. That's good. Yeah, you get to see online. Okay, when I have that attitude, it's, it's pretty useless. Um, but <laughs> if we feel that if we feel that we uh, offer to help fund reconstruction of our house is too low, how do we appeal to get higher funding? For instance. The initial money that we received from FEMA is a grant. We feel that that's too low. How can we appeal that? Best bet is go to the local DRC, that recovery center. You're allowed three appeals, okay, in the process. You have to do a statement of justification. You have to submit that, you can fax that, and scan it, email it. But it has to be able to, there's a form you have to submit. The best bet is to go to the DRC and, and, and appeal that amount, okay? You're allowed three appeals on the process. Uh, timelines, I can't tell you it's based, you know, based individually, but that's something that you have to, you know, talk to somebody about. Okay, but there are steps. And there's three opportunities. Okay, um, we'll move on to, uh, and some of these are still going to relate back to FEMA, but uh, we're we're going to move on to some some other questions to kind of mix it up. Um, is the county offering a buyout plan to Canyon Gate residents? You know, that's something that the state kind of has to Yeah, done. let's let uh, Representative Thurwas, I, I think he kind of briefly uh, touched on that, but um, if you could expand on what kind of uh, time frame we'd be looking at uh, and what would be involved with that. Right, so uh, one of the questions that was brought up and I heard a little bit from the audience is uh, what role can the rainy day fund play in any of this? The rainy day fund can only be authorized to be used by a, a decision of the legislature. We are not in session. It would require a special session of the legislature to do that. <laughs> Guys, keep it down. If, if we're all shy, I will type it. I will type it. And, and many of you who know me know that I have advocated uh, for this. But let's make sure when we go in, we go with some information that we can actually act on. And therefore, there are uh, there are interim hearings starting uh, a week from Monday. In my committee on appropriations, uh, that we will have some in-depth hearings on what financial needs are out there. Uh, and to what degree does the state have the resources to do this? The vast majority of the resources to do anything related to the magnitude that we're talking about for this region are going to be federal resources. The rainy day fund that will not even come close to meeting what those needs are. And so it's very important that we try to, you know, get this process going as quickly and efficiently as possible. Uh, that is being accomplished uh, through the governor's office with the general land officer commissioner, uh, 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 commission and the general land officer commissioner Bush is the one that is kind of pointing on this right now. Uh, the most recent information that I've gotten, which was as of a letter dated yesterday, is that they have identified both short-term and long-term goals in there in terms of how they can leverage the money for its highest and best use. And so that's really where we are right now with that you. I don't really have uh, any more detailed information, but we're very early on in any process uh, as far as trying to uh, leverage those federal resources and the state being in a position to, to help define where they go and get them into the hands of people that need it the most. All right, thank you. Special session. Um, yeah, what do we need to call a special session for that? Uh, and we would need a special session if there was a decision that the rainy day fund needed to uh, be tapped. Uh, the governor and uh, uh, the executive officers of the state have a lot of liberty to move money around in the state's budget uh, in order to meet various needs when you have critical situations like that. That is how they have been functioning right now, and they feel very comfortable that they have the ability to move resources to adequately meet needs right now. The governor is the only person that can call a special session. And he's the only one that could put items that could be considered on the call. And so uh, we have been having ongoing conversations. I know my office has uh, with 
for the people in the governor's office as well as our speaker's office. Um, I think very clearly that if there is a need for us to uh, look at additional resources from a source like the Rain Bay Fund, uh, that that special session will get called. Uh, and we are limited to 30 days to get the work done, and so it has to get done fairly quickly. 900 signatures on a petition sent to the governor in the past few days doesn't count for anything from Canyon Gate residents? So, what are the chances of a buyout or condemnation through eminent domain or an inverse uh, condemnation? And that could be, anyone can answer that question. I know that's kind of a general, but I guess since the Army Corps of Engineers intentionally flooded us, what, what would that look like from the government standpoint of a, a, a buyout? What are our chances of getting a buyout? Zero. <laughs> Uh, the current uh, the current uh, way the program for HMGP or Hazard Mitigation Grant Program uh, is uh, qualifies homes uh, outside the special flood hazard area. Outside of hundred or point one percent chance is through uh, cost analysis, and that is driven a lot by lost history. And um, I, I, so the number, the more times that there is a, a loss on or a claim on a house, the more uh, likely it will be deemed cost beneficial uh, under the benefit cost analysis ratio. Okay. What if uh, what if I want to buy out but my neighbors don't? These programs under the HM, FEMA's program under HMGP or the HUD Community Development Block Grant Program are voluntary acquisition or demolition acquisition programs. So I, I they are voluntary. Is there any potential for new funding to help? New funding or help for our situation that we aren't aware of. Is there is there a potential for new funding or help for our situation that we are not aware of? I guess through the federal government, whether that be through the county, the state. Yeah. So um, there is long-term recovery group funding that may be possibly out there, uh, and so uh, that is a group of. Uh, local partners, community-based organizations, uh, other uh, partners like the Red Cross, NGOs, uh, stakeholders within the community. Uh, it would be my advice that uh, those groups and those individuals start forming and start looking at uh, what other options for funding are available. There's grant funding, there's donated dollars from foundations and such. Uh, the FEMA programs are written by law. There's only so much we can do. It's a bit of what we call a blunt instrument. Uh, it gets the most money out there as early as possible, but there are gaps. Part of our role is to help identify those gaps and to work with partner agencies to fill those gaps. So we don't know what we don't know, but we do know that not everyone's going to qualify, not everyone's going to get enough money, the program is not designed to make people whole. 33300 is the max grant. People are going to need more money. In some cases, we know that. So this is the beginning of the process. This process is going to take some time, months and years, long-term recovery. Thank you. And just to add to that, I know I myself and a lot of my uh, other residents that I'm working with I mean, we understand that this is going to have to be a public-private partnership to help us rebuild, so we're reaching out to corporations, we're reaching out to the J.J. Watt Foundation and other foundations to try to get money into our area. We see a lot of people doing harmony relief, and we're trying to get those dollars and get them directed to our area. Sure. The long-term recovery group, there is the one established in Fort Bend County called Fort Bend Recovers. And there's pamphlets, there's a one-page pamphlet that has numbers on there for information. And this is over and above anything, over and above anything you would get with your 
you know, fee assistance, this is what was just discussed. It's a long-term recovery, it's called Fort Bend Recovers. There's a white sheet, it's got a couple important phone numbers, and they have already worked with some of the local foundations to get money. They're also working, as was indicated by Hugh, with some of the bigger ones that you've been reading about. Those monies haven't been allocated yet. So I would recommend getting with Fort Bend Recovers. One thing that they can do, there's a phone number, they'll give you a case manager that can work with you and help get through some of the issues of deciphering the issues of federal benefits and, and benefits that might be available no matter what your situation is. And it'll be something to kind of stay with you throughout the process. We have two other uh, Recovery centers in Fort Bend County. One of them is in Simonson, Texas. It's down at 1093 at 9703 FM 1489. And the other is at Sienna Plantation NX. That's in Missouri City on the other end of the county at 5855 Springs Way, Missouri City. So there are three recovery centers uh, here in Fort Bend County. Uh, I would anticipate that Simonson uh, probably will have less. Uh, demand that the bill us, Katie Bill Ball does. So that's another area in, in this region you can go to. What was the Simonton address? Uh, the address for Simonton is 9703 FM 1489. If you get to downtown Simonton, Texas, you're at the intersection of 1489 and 1093. Those of you who are familiar with the Simonton Community Church, if you go down 1093, you get to downtown Simonton, Texas. Uh, at the stop sign, you take a left, you go to the church. It'll be on your left. So it's the Simonton Community Church that uh, is the center at. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Myers, let's probably go right back to you. Uh, Wind Bowl, Fort Bend County Appraisal District, release, reassess the value of my flooded property for 2018 tax purpose. And is this going to be automatic, or does my home, or does the homeowner have to issue? Fort Bend County does not reassess your property values as accessible appraisal district. Two weeks ago, Fort Bend County Commission Court requested and authorized accessible appraisal district to automatically reassess all properties that were flooded. If you do not get a reassessment, please contact the Central Appraisal District. That is an independent agency. It's not part of Fort Bend County, uh, although it, it carries the name Fort Bend Central Appraisal District. Uh, the county and the drainage district are the two uh, entities so far. We can only request it for our own tax and entities who have made the request, to my knowledge. Uh, so we are also working with the school district to determine whether or not they are also going to make the same request so that uh, the uh, your property taxes, the value of your property for tax purposes would be reduced to reflect the current value of the flooded home, which is pretty close to zero in many instances. But the uh, uh, County has already taken that action uh, in the drainage district. Uh, we both taken the action to uh, request those reappraisals. So it's, it's at that point in time, the Fort Bend County will pay the Central Appraisal District for those reappraisals. Uh, we estimate that uh, it will be reducing Fort Bend County's tax revenue by about $3.5 million uh, this next year. Uh, but I, I'm not aware of where any of the school districts have made a similar request at this point, although it would be very easy for them to simply tag along with Fort Bend County, and we'll be covering that with them uh, at a future time. Thank you. Uh, this one, well, actually, I'm going to go back to this one. This is a um, when the voluntary evacuation announcement was made on the news, the streets of Canyon Gate, St. Ranch, had approximately two feet of water in some spots, and Mason Road was flooded and impassable by car or truck. The news station, in which the Army Corps of Engineers made the announcement, had been reporting all night that the majority of the streets in Houston and surrounding cities and counties were flooded and impassable. There was no way out of the community at that point. If anyone at the time of the press, see if I said at that point, anyone did decide to voluntarily evacuate. Why weren't any provisions made or announced at the time of the press conference to get people out of these communities via boat, helicopter, etc. Uh, this is a question for 
I'm Jeff Braun. I'm the uh, Emergency Management Coordinator. Um, the, the efforts that were made in EOC to direct the evacuations were done based on the information that we had from the Corps, based on their projections, and we did the best we could, knowing that we also had situations with the Brazos River uh, also flooding at the same time. So we were doing the best we could to get out the evacuation notices, uh, putting out the information, whether it was on Facebook, social media, or uh, sending out reverse 911s. Our technology prevents some of that reverse 911 to work as quickly as we'd like, something we're looking into. But the effort was made to get those that information out as quickly as we could. And have you guys learned any lessons of how you can communicate better in the future? Oh, heck, oh, heck, oh, I want to apologize the way this is happening. I think it could have been handled better. Uh, no offense to uh, Jeff and his staff, they work very uh, hard, very diligently. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole laundry list of things that, that uh, we could do, uh, frankly. Uh, and some of them we did, uh, and some of them we did not do. Uh, uh, we we kind of had two dress rehearsals over the last two years, uh, 15 plus. We played uh, people in Simonton, uh, people in Simonton, and uh, other areas we played. Uh, and uh, a better coordination would, would have helped, in our opinion, that's the past. We are going to do better. Uh, we're going to make certain that uh, things are done better. The uh, OEM, uh, Jeff is the head of it, uh, is headed by uh, our Corbin County Judge uh, Hebert. Uh, he is the emergency manager. He is a very diligent and a very capable executive. He works very hard. Uh, and uh, through his efforts, I know that we're going to make improvements, uh, not only in our response that we had this last time, and I personally want to thank all the volunteers who volunteered, to, who stepped up, all the churches, all the schools, who simply volunteered their time and their uh, <laughs>
All he has to do is meet the requirements under the law that uh, we have to comply with, and he can do with uh, his property whatever he wants. If he wants to build a apartment complex, he can do so without any restrictions from the county. If he wants to build a subdivision wherever he wants to build it, as long as he meets the criteria called for in the law, he has the right to do that. The county commissioner's court does not have the authority to regulate any kind of development under current state law. Each legislative session, and, and uh, Dr. Zerlis has helped us with this, but his colleagues uh, actually beat the legislation. Uh, we know the legislature trying to get a little bit more authority for counties to be able to regulate some land development and the developers to beat us each time. So uh, it's, there's nothing we can do to prevent developers from buying land that is private land and developing it according to the requirements of the law. They did that. The best we could do is to have as many restrictions with regard to, as allowed by the law, with regard to their development. And, and frankly, Fort Bay County has some of the most restrictive development requirements of any area in this region. Houston, for example, Harris County, for example, does not, did not have the specific uh, statement on the flats that you, if you live in the Barton Reservoir, you live in an area that can be inundated with water. We also put restrictions, as, as Mark would, uh, pointed out, with regard to how high they had to build the slabs. Other uh, counties in the region uh, do not have a similar requirements in, in some cases. Uh, so the county uh, did the only thing we could under the current law, uh, and, and there is nothing else that could have been done under uh, Texas state law. Change the law. Change the law. Well, we do have one more vote, guys. Um, uh, another question that came in concerning rebuilding A, is it safe to start rebuilding? Do we need any special certifications or permits through the county or state as far as building permits, uh, mulch certifications, uh, anything to that nature? For those that live in the area controlled by Fort Bay County, wait, for those in, in the Fort Bay County controlled areas, but you are outside the 1% chance flood area, you do not require an inspection from the county or a permit. You can rebuild. Many of these in, in Canyon Gate actually fall in. Um, Little Fort Ridge District, they're their own community with for the flood management. They are also not requiring an inspection or a permit to rebuild because you are outside the 100 year floodplain, the 1% chance. Okay, what for, the <laughs> if, if you go to the Fort Bend County website under engineering, the top banner, the first thing on the top banner will say flood recovery. There will be a map in there, you can put in your address, it will tell you, number one, what jurisdiction you're in, number two, whether you're in the 100 year flood plain. That will tell you what you need to do beyond that point. You can call our office at 281-633-7500, they will put in the address for you, and give you the information if you don't want to do it yourself. It will tell you whether you are in the 100 year floodplain or not, and whether you need an inspection. 201 633 7500. Oh, that is Fort Bend County Engineering. And if, if you are in another jurisdiction, you can either get it off the website or my staff will give it to you. If you're in uh, the drainage or a little Fort drainage districts, if you're in the Big Oaks Mud, there are several other entities, what we call communities up here, that manage their own floodplain. How about fingers? Um, Dr. Turles, is there anything at the state level requiring any uh, certifications or permitting to rebuild? No. Okay. That's enough. Um,
my understanding that the Barnes Reservoir was in the process of being updated or reconstructed before Hurricane Harvey. Is this true? If so, please explain what exactly is being done and how long the reconstruction process will take. That would be a question for the Corps. However, Fort Bend County Engineering is not aware of any projects that they had ongoing within the reservoir. Uh, I recently read an article that they were installing new dam doors uh, that were supposed to be completed in 2020. Do you guys have any information on that? They need to speak to that. The federal government does not re is not required to give us or get any permits from us or anything like that. They supersede our authority. Okay, thank you. Sir, back to the previous question, how about FEMA's requirements? Can you start construction before their inspection? Yeah, thank you, I heard that. Um, so, um, you are provided you can take photos of the damaged area. You can, in fact, remove uh, the damaged wallboard uh, and begin um, preliminary repairs. You need to document, document, document. So take photographs of everything. Uh, you save receipts if you've begun purchasing materials. Um, and uh, you want to have that information available for your inspector. So yes, please do begin the process uh, of cleaning out your home, making it safe and habitable, uh, and know that uh, that will not prevent you from uh, getting the service you deserve. We're, we're talking about rebuilding, putting walls back up. Yeah, you, you can begin to do repair work, uh, and, and, and so long as you keep all of those receipts uh, in advance, well, they keep all the receipts that you use, and document everything that you're doing. So uh, you, you might want to keep some of the wall open if you haven't had your inspection yet. Um, but uh, you know you can begin that process. If we start rebuilding, will that negatively affect us if a buyout does come down the road at some point in time? If we start rebuilding? You know, the, the, the buyout question I know is looming here, but that's going to be some time as we've heard about the process. Uh, so people are going to need to get back into their home, um, so um, it should not affect it uh, because people are going to need to be in their homes for the next year and a half or two years or whatever time frame it may be until a buyout is possible. Real quickly, uh, so I missed part of the question as to if you are in the 1% or even the floodway, in that case you will need an inspection from the county as well as a permit if you are substantially damaged. The reason I didn't really get into that is most of the area up here is not in the 1% flood area. Only if you are in Willow Fork, uh, quite a bit further north on Westheimer Parkway, which, or West, yeah, Westheimer Parkway, which should be into that area. The Cinco Ranch, Grand Mission, uh, Cinco Ranch area, those are all either in the 500 or what we call Zone X, which is outside the 500. You know, the best thing you can do is go to the website or call my staff, put in your exact address, and it will show us on the map, and we can answer specifically to your situation. Okay, this is an SBA loan question. Why am I hearing that people are being approved for uh, SBA loans at different rates and terms? The SBA gentleman stepping up. Just one point I want to make about rebuilding uh, before we move on there. It's important that uh, before you start putting wall board back on, that the house is adequately dry. It should be down to a percentage of around 12%. Uh, but that's important because you don't want to be putting wall board back up and the home is still wet on the inside and you're going to get, uh, you get old and damaged that way. Yeah, well, let me get the SBA guy on. He can't answer every individual question, but let's... Uh, can you repeat that question for the SBA gentleman? Um, why am I hearing that people are being approved for SBA loans at different uh, interest rates and terms? Uh, we, have, we have two interest rates. We have we call it a, a market rate and below market rate. The vast majority of our interest rates are at the below market rate. For homeowners, that's 1.75 percent. For business owners, that would be 3.3 percent. There are circumstances uh, where we do a formula for income. If you have uh, in big income, unencumbered assets, 
large amount of unencumbered assets. We take into consideration the amount of damage, the size of your household. Then you may have to pay the higher rate, and that's the way the law is written. Um, are we exempt from paying property taxes since we need the money for the rebuild? Mr. Meyer, can you speak for one part of that as far as the property taxes go? Uh, if there's anyone from the mud districts around here that can maybe speak to what they're looking at, uh, welcome you up here to respond. And of course, we also have KDISD that we pay to, which I doubt they're going to let us off the taxes with their budget. Unfortunately, you need to pay your property taxes and pay it on time or you have to go to public. Uh, having said that, if you are 65 or over or you're disabled, you have an opportunity under current law to uh, essentially suspend your, uh, all of your tax payments uh, by making an application to the Central Appraisal District. Uh, uh, Dr. Zermos and the legislature recently reduced the interest carrying rate. Uh, I don't remember what that amount was right off the top of my head. It used to be 8%. I think it's down to 5 I believe. Uh, in any event, if you're 65 or over, uh, this is uh, available to you. Uh, obviously, your tax is approved uh, until the property is sold. Uh, and all the time, that's unfortunately after you're gone. Uh, but uh, you do not have to pay your taxes by, if you apply uh, for that through the Central Appraisal District. Other than that, the rest of you, unfortunately, are going to have to pay uh, your taxes and pay all the time before the bill. So currently, there's no discounts available? Well, when you mentioned, I mentioned earlier that, that Fort Bend County itself and its drainage uh, uh, district is having your property reappraised so that it will be taxed uh, from the August date, whatever it is, through the end of this year and obviously next year uh, at a lower tax taxable value. Uh, uh, the rate will be the same, but the taxable value of your home will be less for Fort Bend County taxes and the drainage district taxes. Now, unfortunately, our county taxes only uh, account for about 15 or 16 percent of your total taxes. So uh, the other 85, 84, 85 percent comes from your school district and your bud and your other tax jurisdiction. They will also have to join in with the county to make the same request in order for all of your taxes to be taxed at the lower taxable value. Thank you. I'm David Drake here from Cinco Mud Five to respond. Much up. Um, it's up to each mud in each taxation district whether they are going to reappraise. Um, single mud seven had a special meeting and we authorized a reappraisal. Uh, a resolution uh, submitted on Monday. So anyone in single seven that was affected will have a reduced rate uh, for the final the final four months. It's it's important that each of you talk to your mud board uh, representative and stress that you would like them to do that in, in the affected areas as well, especially single single mud five, six, and eight. Um, kind of wrap around, wrap around the bayou. You also uh, anyone anyone that has influence should talk to KDISD. KDISD, of course, is our school taxes are the largest portion of your property taxes, and. If, if, if there's enough pressure put on the district, then they will have they will have to have uh, reappraisal done. Okay, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how does FEMA calculate and pay living expenses? And it kind of leads into the second question. Those inspected last last pay more for living costs and therefore have less money to repair. This does not seem fair. I believe the living expenses are separate from your, um, your your structural monies that you get paid out. But uh, if someone can elaborate on how does FEMA calculate and pay living expenses? There are few. There you go. I'm not entirely sure how that process comes up with the grant assistance. How much you can receive? Um, like I said, your rental assistance is part of your grant assistance overall grant. Um, 
It's usually about $1,000 to $2,000. Um, I would say they leave with your um, But that does come out of the grant, essentially.
you're going to have issues. But what is what are any improvements that we can do to the reservoir? How long would that take? How much would that cost? Can anyone speak to that? I guess that would be the Army Corps of Engineers who are not here. I can speak to it. In Florida, they have water management. Okay, but you're not with the Army Corps of Engineers, sir. I'm sorry, but we need, we need official information. Not that you know your information uh, would be bad, but we need to, to have an official. He's correct. The uh, Corps of Engineers has the responsibility for the Park Reservoir, and what they do is going to be up to them. I anticipate they'll be looking at the issues. With regard to the county, what we can do is we continue to do that. As Marcus pointed out, we've had we continue to update our uh, drainage studies to make certain that we are uh, up to date as we can. As uh, some of you uh, may or may not be aware, in 2014, uh, FEMA. Uh, change the or did uh, another analysis and change some of the floodways and flood plain areas in Fort Bend County we updated that. We are, uh, are authorizing another uh, study, a uh, countywide study, uh, to examine the effects of this uh, flood to determine what of anything we can do. We understand some of the basic things that the county can do and that is to improve our drainage system. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, we are constrained by the federal government with regard to getting permits and doing things that are counter to what uh, uh, the environmental regulations call for. So uh, uh, we are doing what we can. Uh, there, there are obviously going to be some state efforts uh, uh, looking at uh, some additional uh, reservoirs uh, which uh, take federal dollars to develop. There is a reservoir that uh, has been proposed on the upper uh, uh, Brazos River uh, in the uh, Range or, or College Station area that uh, would uh, provide some assistance, some help. Uh, the Cypress Creek Reservoir was also mentioned. Uh, the improvements of downstream flow was also mentioned. All of these, unfortunately, take a lot of time. One of the things that Dr. Zerlos, uh, Congressman Olson, uh, and the county are going to be requesting of the federal government is to give us uh, waivers on these environmental studies so that we can get these studies done, uh, our, our, our construction started as quickly as possible to solve uh, these problems before we have another event of this nature. Uh, and unfortunately, it takes, uh, takes a, a bit of this nature to get the attention of the federal government to do the thing that they should have done 30 years ago. Uh, they didn't do it. So we're faced with this particular problem. But we are going to be pushing as hard as we can from a local, state, and with our congressional delegation to get the uh, federal government to grant the waiver so that we can move forward as quickly as we can uh, to address these issues. Can you please dredge the bayous? So one thing that I've learned going through this, and I'm not a public official, so I can speak a little bit more candidly, but we need to really push for the world control over our watersheds and waterways because the county wants to and needs to dredge the bodies and make them wider and we so But we are handcuffed by the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA on doing that because it's controlled federally. They want us to do eight to ten year environmental studies before we even start construction, which is going to take even more time. So we need to get that local control back here uh, and have some common sense protocols for this. So we can handle the water better and get this. You can get so, uh, I think we're, we're out of question. You have a good uh, one. One thing that can be done, it's very simple, in front of your houses, um, if you still have if you still have mud in, in, the, in the gutters, get it out. Because the storm drains are already throughout the district, are already half full of soot, uh, mud, silt. So if you, can, if you can clean up your street, there's less chance that in a big rain, your street will flood again. So that's a very simple thing that everybody can continue to do while we, while we try to get the, get the county and the state and the federal government to move on fires. Most of the questions we have, we understand, are, are individual questions, individual issues for each of you. So, uh, again, the best thing that we can re uh, request, uh, the county is not the state, the county is not uh, FEMA, but not the federal government. We do not have the answers that they have. If you have a specific question with regard to a FEMA question with reimbursement of building, etc., etc., call FEMA. 
contact FEMA. Get your answer from FEMA. Go to the uh, recovery center. We gave you three locations you can go to in Portman County. Contact them. With regard to the state, Dr. Service has already said his office will be happy to help and answer the questions. With regard to the federal government, if you run into an issue with FEMA, uh, Ty has already mentioned that Congressman Olson will be more than happy to uh, fight on your behalf to make certain that you get the information you have. If you have an issue with the, with the local government, contact my office. Uh, and many of you already have, and we will continue to uh, respond. Uh, if you have an issue with regard to uh, how, how the county responded, contact Jeff, uh, our, our uh, uh, county judge, uh, Bob Hebert's office, and they will help address those issues. So we have done our best. We have a, uh, we have a cheat sheet out there that has uh, contact information for all of these agents on there. You can contact them by phone or, or uh, by email. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our meeting is going to be adjourned. Thank you. I want to make one last quick statement. We all saw how horrible the traffic was uh, during all this. Uh, all the trailers, plug, there's a mobility bond coming up on the election in November. Uh, there's a lot of streets out there that need to be widened and need to be connected so that we can handle that traffic better. Please consider voting for that.